So, Dr. Fauci, um, we are talking about misinformation here on Verify. We're all about fighting misinformation, and you, of course, know that misinformation ran rampant over the past few years, especially during this pandemic. So, do you see misinformation as a public health issue? Oh, I absolutely see it as a public health issue. Misinformation and disinformation uh, in so many areas, but take one for example, the misinformation and disinformation about vaccines, denying its rather substantial efficacy in saving lives and its safety, which is a very, very good safety record. Misinformation that's, that steers people away from getting a potentially life-saving vaccine for COVID, for example, could truly lead to a loss of life. And there's an estimation that literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths could have been averted if people who should have been vaccinated got vaccinated but did not because of misinformation and disinformation that steered them away from getting vaccinated. So it is truly a public health issue. Sometimes, though, the misinformation may come from old information. Of course, we saw changing guidance over how long quarantine should be, who could get COVID, how you get COVID. And of course, you know, the CDC has admitted some communication missteps throughout all of this, and it's led to some people pushing back on health care regulations and guidance. It's led to some people just being burned out on paying attention to any of it. So how do you connect with those people? Well, what we really have to try and explain and do a better job of it is that when you're dealing with a moving target, like we have been dealing with with COVID, I mean, what we knew in January of 2020 was very different from what we learned in February, March, April, and then into 2021 about how the virus spreads, its efficiency in spreading, the fact that the virus can be transmitted from one person to another 50 to 60% of the time from someone who has no symptoms at all, which impacts greatly a recommendation or not for the wearing of masks. Also learning about the evolution of different variants, the virus that we were dealing with in January and February of 2020 is a very different virus that we're dealing with now with all the different variants. So what we need to do is to make it much more clear that when things are said on the basis of data that you have at a given time, you've got to always realize that that information could change next month or six months from now. And that's really the nature of science. It's self-correcting. And you've got to look at the data you have most recently that aligns with what the facts really are. You mentioned things that you can do better, you know, in mentioning things that you can do better, despite decades in your job here, it seems like you learned quite a bit over the past couple of years about the communication aspect of public health. How will public health officials or rather how should public health officials communicate the next public health crisis and how should us journalists communicate with the public as well? Well, First of all, it's obviously stick with the facts, stick with the science, maintain an open mind, and be flexible, knowing that as things evolve, particularly in the dynamic nature of an outbreak, that things will change. And they will, as long as they change, you've got to follow the facts and the data and try to communicate it as accurately as you can. We are faced with a very specific problem with this outbreak is that our nation, for anyone who's even paying a little bit of attention, is really in an era of extraordinary divisiveness, where ideological differences spill over into recommendations about public health. And that should never be the case, because public health principles are sound principles. And if you veer one way or the other, depending on your ideology, there's no place for the instilling of political ideology into public health principles. Of course, you know as well as anybody that uh, we saw personality become such an aspect of the past several years. You know, you being one of the faces of 
the fight against COVID. I watched you on Stephen Colbert get your bivalent booster. Um, you were really out there in these White House daily press briefings and this becoming the face of it has given you both uh, household name status as well as attracted some criticism for perhaps stepping into that spotlight or people if they didn't trust you anymore, they would stop trusting overall health guidance. And so do you feel like you did the right thing by stepping into the role in the way you did? Yes, I believe so. I, 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 I didn't step into it because I woke up one day and said, I think I'm going to step into this. It just evolved with my responsibility as the director of the institute that does most of the funding and the research on infectious diseases and my experience over 54 years at the Institute and 38 years as the director of the Institute, it fell naturally upon me to assume that responsibility. You said recently in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, quote, there is no reason to believe that the threat of emerging infections will diminish since their underlying causes are present and most likely increasing. Um, that sounds a little foreboding. It sounds not like what a lot of people want to hear, where we're just tired of talking about pandemics, infectious diseases and whatnot. Um, so how confident are you in Americans' abilities to confront the next public health crisis, given our response to the current one? Well, if we learn the lessons that we should have learned from our experience with the current outbreak, as well as prior outbreaks, we can do much better and be prepared. There will be subsequent outbreaks. It may not happen next year. It may not happen five years or 10 years from now, but it will happen. History has taught us that. We have been confronted with pandemic outbreaks for centuries, even before the recorded history. And in our own lifetime, we've had HIV, we've had COVID, we've had Ebola, we've had Zika, so that's what I meant in that article, that there's every reason to believe that we're going to have more. We just need to use the lessons that we've learned from prior outbreaks to help prepare us for the future ones. You said the beginning of your answer to that question was if we've learned the lessons. Do you believe we have? Well, I hope so. We, we'll have to just wait and see. One of the problems is that people and countries' corporate memory often fades when you distance yourself from the event that you were concerned with and people tend to focus on what the current real and present danger is and not what might happen next year or the year after. That's why it becomes difficult to convince people that we need to have a perpetual readiness for the next outbreak. Looking at what's happening in China right now with the protests against the most uh, severe COVID restrictions that we're seeing internationally still in 2022 there, um, and seeing the way people are lashing out against that, but then also seeing how people had spoken out against public health officials in their own communities over the course of the past few years. How does policy interact with medicine in the most useful way? How can we, uh, how can you as a doctor best inform the policymaker? And when is it going too far? Well, I don't mean, know what you mean by going too far. You have to make your information flow and your recommendations and your guidelines based on sound public health and scientific and medical principles and go with the data. You have to look at the evidence that's unfolding as well as the experience that you might have had in prior outbreaks. For example, it is very clear that one of the most important life-saving tools of an outbreak is vaccines. So the idea that we have so many people pushing back on vaccines is really tragic, is the real word for it, because it results in the loss of life that's unnecessary loss of life and preventable loss of life. So it merely means sticking to the public health principles and the scientific facts. Mm -hmm. um, just two more quick questions for you, Dr. Fauci, in our time that we have. Um, you know, I guess what I meant by the quote unquote going too far is that some people had questions about when the CDC guidance for how long quarantine should be seemed to change at the whim of what employers and businesses were hoping to see. And they had questions about was medicine informing policy or was policy informing medicine? And how would you 
describe that relationship? Yeah, I think for the most part, it was that medicine was informing policy. I mean, policy, sometimes you have to take into account the practicality of what you're recommending. If you recommend something that's impossible to implement, then obviously you want to have the reality on the ground inform what your ultimate recommendation or guideline will be. But the core basis of recommendations should always be scientific, medical, and public health principles. We're living in a world where pretty soon we're not going to see as much of you on our televisions as we have gotten used to over the past few years, but people are still going to be seeing TikToks, Instagram videos, tweets, and whatnot about medical information. And so what is your advice to the, our viewers about how to best discern true and good health information? Well, I think you should use as your source not somebody who's got no experience or basis of knowledge and spends a lot of time tweeting or spends a lot of time on FaceTime. You should base the kinds of decisions you make for your own health and that of your family on trusted sources. You know, the CDC is a trusted source. You go to cdc.gov, you go to nih.gov, you go to fda.gov, you can get the facts and the truth about what needs to be done when you're dealing with a variety of medical challenges. So I would stay away from learning from tweets and maybe learn from authorities. I'll squeeze in one more bonus question since I think we have just a couple more minutes here. Dr. Fauci, I read that you are interested in spending the next part of your career mentoring the next generation of public health officials. What do you hope to teach them? Well, exactly what we've been talking about, about the importance uh, of science, of medical, uh, public health, and hopefully even inspire some people to get involved in public service the way I have been for almost 60 years, because you can accomplish a lot and get a great deal of gratification about doing things that serves the general public. And I believe that there is a lot of young and passionate people out there who could do a very good job if they got into public service, particularly in the arena of health and medicine. Absolutely. Dr. Fauci, um, anything else that you would like to add as part of our discussion, especially as it relates well, to going into another cold and flu season here? <laughs> We're already in yeah. a, a flu season. We're not going into yeah, it. Yeah, true. No, I think people should just, as we get into the colder we uh, weather of the late fall and early winter, you know, if you've not been vaccinated against COVID, please do and certainly get a flu vaccine. And if you don't have yet your updated booster for COVID, please get it. It's important to protect yourself and your family from a serious consequence of COVID. Absolutely, especially with that one with the low uptake on that vaccine so far. So Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for uh, your service to this country. I appreciate it and wish you all the best. Thank you. All right.